when you got a bad knee, you got to take the long way around. So that's, that's the reason for all that. Well, good morning and welcome. It's a great honor to be in your church this morning. Um, obviously, I don't need a microphone, so I choose not to, chose not to use one this morning. Um, when you come in and you hear traditional gospel and Christian music, it's, it's so moving. When you see a young gentleman come up and pray at the altar on a Sunday morning, it's moving. Um, and that's what we're here for, is to let the Lord move in this house today. Amen. When I got this invitation a week or so ago, it was, it was a tremendous honor. We're really busy in July. I coach girls select basketball, and we're leaving this afternoon to Florida for a couple of tournaments, but I'm glad it worked out, and I hope it works out again in the future. And yeah, it's 100 degrees outside, but what a beautiful, clear day, and when you get your chance to do that in the house of the Lord and see the sun, sun shining through these beautiful windows, it just says that we know that the Lord is in the house today. I want to dig right into the message because I've got a lot to cover for you and I'll try to stay on time. Um, but our message title today is Truth for Any Tribe. Truth for Any Tribe. Now what does that mean exactly? And it means this. No matter what trial you face today, the truth of Christ will be with you. And that's why our title today is Truth for Any Tribe. Our scripture today is just going to be one or two verses, and boy, they're powerful. Um, and I'm going to repeat them numerous times because I think the emphasis today is to not study a verse, but I mean really dig in deep to the verse. And that's what we're going to try to do today. And if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, if you would talk, turn to Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans 8, 28. And while you're making your way there, I ask if you would please stand in the presence of the Lord for the reading of His Word. Please stand with me. Once again, one verse and one verse only for now, but it's a good one. And I'm going to read to you from the ESV. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. This verse is believed by many to be the greatest verse in the Bible for Christians. Please be seated. Now that says a lot. If it's the greatest verse in the Bible for Christians, whether it is or it's not, many scholars believe this. And we know it's a great verse and one of the most recognized verses in the Bible. And as we go through today, I'm going to try to show you why it's the greatest verse in the Bible for Christians. Now, what is the greatest verse in the Bible? I think we would all agree that either the greatest verse or the most popular verse in the Bible is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. I think we would all agree either most popular or greatest verse in the Bible. Almost everybody in the work can quote that scripture if they can't quote anything else. But you might want to think about, if you haven't already, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, memorize this and oh, what a great one. If you want to pass somebody at the gas station today and tell them that you're a Christian and you believe in God, and could you share that with them? Romans 8, 28 is a, is a great place to start. If you can't remember John 3, 16 is a great place to start. Two tremendous verses. Do you remember the old saying, maybe your parents said it, maybe you say it to your kids, that the only thing, only two things in life that are certain are death and taxes. You remember that old saying? You probably use it yourself. I've said that. The only two things in life that are certain are death and taxes. Oh, it's not true. Because I can promise you today the words written in Romans 8.28 are a guarantee. They're certain. You can bet your life on this scripture. 
And I know that's just rhetoric and all that is just kind of a joke. But the whole thing, the whole point I want to make to say to you that it is a guarantee, this verse, this verse in Romans 8, 28 is a guarantee. You know, we all have, we all have dark places in our lives. Maybe they're valleys, you know, you're going along, things are okay. Maybe you get a raise at work and boy, you get a peak in your life. Or maybe you buy a new home or maybe there's a new grandbaby or there's a celebration. you got these peaks in your life. But sometimes you go along and then there's the valley. You know, you got that old valley. And you know, the, the old saying is that well, you're either in a, in a trial, you're about to be in a trial, or you just left a trial and that's the way life works. Well, that's pretty true. <coughs> And these trials, these valleys in our life can be, oh, they can be horrible things. They can be fear and confusion and stress and anxiety and all kinds of things. And when you're walking through these valleys, these things that have knocked you off track, the things that maybe you lost a loved one or maybe you lost a job or you've got some financial problems or some health issues that you're facing, and you're going through these valleys and you especially need the life-giving promises of God. To sustain it. Try to true word from the Word of God like Romans 8, 28. Things that you can depend on that they remind you that every word in the Bible is breathed from God. is from His mouth and from His being. Every word in the Bible. And when you read Romans 8, 28 and you're going through these valleys, these challenges in your life, you can depend on these words. And many Christ followers point to these words as the truth that helps, helped you and me and all of us get through challenging and difficult times. When all else failed, when all else failed, we turned to God and there He was for us. Oh, He's all being. He knows everything. He can be everything at every place at one time. And we can't understand. I can't comprehend how He can have His hand around my shoulder and your shoulder and your shoulder and somebody in Japan and a million other people around the world to say, I can't comprehend it. But I know it's true because the Bible says it's true. And others have stood down dawning difficult challenges in their life through the promises that we read in Romans 8, 28 and John 3, 16 and all throughout the Bible. But why is this verse so comforting, so powerful, if it is? You know, the reason I learned the thing about the greatest verse in the Bible for Christians from my friend James McDonald. You may know James. He's a worldwide pastor teaching all over the world. And he, he taught me a lot of this about the greatest verse in the Bible for Christians and so forth. And, and so he said, why is it so comforting? Why is this verse something you can turn to and it be so comforting to you? Excuse me. And the first three words is really a good start because the first three words of that Bible, of that Bible verse, says, "And we know, and we know." We don't merely think, we don't merely hope, we don't merely wonder. It may be it's true. The Bible doesn't make mistakes, and it tells us right there, "And we know, and we know." And the word "know" communicates certainty, and knowledge, and it comes from experiences in your life. When you've had these challenges, maybe these valleys in your life, and you turn to Romans 8, 28, or John 3, 16, or some favorite verse in Philippians, or anywhere, it becomes your testimony. It becomes your testimony that you can tell others, I went through this, and through the help of the Scripture and God's Word, I was able to get out. That's your testimony. And you know because you lived through the testing. And God's Spirit has confirmed that what you have learned, this knowing isn't something you necessarily feel in the moment, but time will prove God's Word and His character is good. God is always there for you. God is a loving and caring God. God died for your sins. You know, I can tell you God died for sins. And that's a fact. But his person, God died for your sins, and he died for mine. What a great comfort that that is. Try and true realities in his word about how he works. He wrote you a book, he gave you a life plan that you can follow. 
2,000 some years ago, He gave His life for you on that cross so you could live. So you could live. And only God's children, those who have turned from their sins and embraced Christ by faith, understand the great promise and the great comfort of this passage. Only do those who have tested the promises of God through the Scripture truly know that once again His faithfulness is there for you each and every time. And they've seen, you've seen, I've seen God work in my life. I can tell you endless stories of real stories that God has worked in my life and others in my life when all happened was break the loose. Things were bad, things were disaster, we didn't know where to turn. But that God was there to say, let me help you with that situation. And God helps us to know. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. We may not even know what to pray for. You may have a loss of a loved one in your family and you're so distraught you don't even know what to say. You turn to everything before you turn to God and I do it all the time. My biggest weakness. Oh, how am I going to solve this? Oh, how am I going to do this? What am I going to do? And then finally somewhere along the way I get around to saying, maybe I should pray. Maybe I should pray. And the more God intercedes, oh my gosh, things start to change in your life. You could have it in your life today. You could have a, a child that's ill or a child that's, you haven't seen in a while or a job situation. I don't know. We all face our little things every day. But if we all understand that we can turn to Christ every time for His help. Because we may forget about Him sometimes. We do some really do it a lot when things are going good or going up. But when things get bad, that's when we go to Him. Let's maybe try to think of a way to go to Him for the good. You know, I have a cousin who's a Church of Christ pastor in East Texas. And uh, when I was first learning to be a Christian, and I did it way late in life. Let me just tell you, I did it. I got married way late in life. And to my beautiful wife, Mark, she was here on the road with me today. And I came to Christ. You know, I was, I was a typical up and down Christian. Oh, I was really good, and then I was really bad, and then I was nothing, and then I was really good. Oh, I'd go to church for a year, never missed, and then I'd go to church for a year, and then I was all over it. But when I finally came to Christ, my cousin said to me, Boy, that's what he says. Boy, do you know how to pray? Do you know how to pray? That's what he asked. Me. Well, yeah. Now he said, No, do you know how to pray? And I said, Well, I guess you're going to tell me, and he did. And he said, I'll just tell you this: when you pray to God, don't ask Him for anything. Don't ask Him for anything until you thank Him for everything. If you throw out your whole your whole list of requests. Before you thank Him for letting me wake up this morning, or you thank Him for that problem you got you through last week, or you thank Him for that car wreck that He helped you avoid, before you thank Him for all that, that you have a wife and a home and food on the table and all of that, you got to do all of that before you can say, Oh Lord, I could use some, some money to help pay the bill or whatever the case might be in your life. So I learned a lot about prayer. You know, God's not always going to tell us how He's going to work things for the good or for whatever situation in our life. But the promise is He will. He may not roll it out today when you get to the car and say, oh yeah, you asked me for this this morning, and here's how I'm going to do it. He may not do it. He might. God can do anything. But the promise is He will. He may not do it today. He may not do it like you want it. He may not do it in your time. But he'll do. And the answer to that is one simple word. It's faith. Faith is the promise that God will answer prayers in His time. Life's difficulties may have caught us off guard. You wonder if God is good sometimes if you've had some tragedy in your life. Maybe even wonder if He's there. Sometimes. Oh God, how could that be? How could God let someone... How could God let my wife be taken or my son be taken? Or how could God let me lose a job? Oh, it's frustrating sometimes. And we can't contribute anything to good. 
We get in that rut and we don't know what to say and we get away from Christ and we don't know how to pray and we probably don't pray and, and then we're way off track. And though you may not see the good yet, you know, you may not even see the good in this lifetime. God doesn't promise you that He'll answer in this lifetime. Your answer might be in heaven. But He does promise you that He'll answer. He does promise you. It's a wonderful, wonderful guarantee. And if it happened to you, it had to come through God. It really did. It has to be. If you weren't going to use the situation for your good, it wouldn't have happened. I can promise you that. The Word tells us. It's not Marty telling you that. It's Marty just translating and reading the Scripture. It really is that. And God is not the cause of evil. He's the, he's the solution. He's the master chess player who knows every move he will make and he strategizes to ensure his purposes, his will is accomplished. Because we all know, my friends, loved ones, that the devil is real. And he's going to do everything he can today and every day to knock you off track. To mess up your life. Oh, you don't need to go to church today. Oh, you got plenty of time later on to read the Bible. You know, let's go do something else. And then before you know it, you're not thinking about that stuff anymore. And the devil's little ploy for the time being has worked. And the ultimate good of Romans 8, 28 and other great verses in the Bible is not some little blueprint that you created in your mind for his plan in your life. It, it's way bigger than that. Oh God, He's going to take care of me. But His real blueprint plan is for the whole universe and your little place in it. And yes, He's personal. God did not only forgive sins, He forgave your sin. And He does have a big blueprint for the whole universe. But in that big blueprint, yeah, you're in there. You're in there. And I'm going to tell you something today at the end of the message that I hope you will find the most comforting thing that you've heard in the world. And it's all about His glory and at the very same time He works for your good in all ways. I want to read it again just so we don't lose track. Romans 8, 28. We know for that, that, we know for that those who love God all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Believe it, my friends. Expect it and wait for it. Count it as one of those guarantees in life like Desmond taxes. This is a guarantee. This is a certainty. I'm going to ask you two questions. I maybe encourage you to journal them later with some thoughts or just make a mental note today of, of these two questions. They're good. What are some past circumstances in your life that may have been really, really hard, but which God ultimately worked with? Can you think of some of those really hard, didn't see a way out, maybe an illness, maybe a whatever, maybe a job, but ultimately God worked for good. Make some mental notes of that. Maybe jot it down later. Some things that God worked that you just and you couldn't see. It's just too hard. And here's question number two. Since we know that God promises to work all things together for good, for those who love Him. It tells us in the Scripture that we read. Are there things in your life that you seem too broken to turn to God? You know you say that, oh I know God's big, but He ain't going to handle this. He can't handle this until this is too big. You got some of those? You got some of those where you say, well I do pray to God, I do read my Bible with this problem. No, oh, I can't take it that. Well I can assure you, it's easy to say nothing's too big for God. I can also tell you nothing's too small for God. If it's important to you, it's important to God. If you're worried about the test at school this week during school year and you pray to God and you say, well, that's my new God probably doesn't have time for some little pity thing like a test. He does. Or I got this huge deal. I've been diagnosed with cancer. I'm about to be set up with all this treatment and I've got to go through all these procedures. And everything in between. 
And if you've got these things on your mind today that you think God won't or can't, for some reason doesn't handle, don't leave this room today with those on your mind. Let's pray about those. Let's just say, it's big, but you're bigger. I'm weak and you're strong. I'm just going to give this to you and let you handle it. And the promise, the promise is through the Word is that He will do that for you and for me. So don't leave the room and don't think that that little thing or that huge thing is something God don't want to listen. If it's important to you, it's important to Him. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term scripted prayer. I'm not a big fan of scripted prayers. These are prayers that are written down previous to something and then you, you read them maybe to the congregation and you don't really add your feelings. They're done ahead of time. And so I'm not a big fan of, of scripted prayers. I'd rather just pray from the heart. But my friend Jamie McDonald, though I mentioned to you earlier, sent me a prayer, scripted prayer, in relation to this sermon. And he said, I think this will help get the point home. And I'm going to read it to you. And the prayer has a title, and it's called, Let's Talk to the Lord. And this scripted prayer says, Dear Lord, sometimes when I feel overwhelmed by dark, confusing circumstances, I don't even know what to pray for. But thank you, Holy Spirit, for lovingly, powerfully converting my inarticulate groans into deep prayer. Thank you for interceding for me according to God's will. My faith, by faith, I believe that you are working behind the scenes for my good and your glory. Dear God, I do love you and thank you for this awesome truth. Please grow my faith to the point that I never question this life giving promise. In Jesus' name. Amen. What a what a wonderful prayer. Because sometimes we don't know what to do. Sometimes we need the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we need God to intervene. Show us a direction of which way to pursue in our life. Alright. If, if you're not sure if your relationship with God is where it needs to be. Let me just ask you this question. And if you, if you change your thoughts on this answer, if it is one way or the other, then I think it'll help. When you pray to God and ask Him for help in a matter, do you hope He will answer your prayer? Or do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that He will answer your prayer? And that's the difference between a pretty good Christian and a Christian. If you pray to God and you know without a shadow of a doubt that He's going to answer that prayer in His time, then you, you've come a long way in your walk of Christ. And if you are not there, then there's ways to get us there. And it's hard to do. Oh my gosh. So it is hard. But let's say, if we turn it all to God and truly believe at some point in time, and that time might be in heaven, that He's going to answer that prayer, then your walk with Christ is strong. It's really we're going to start to wrap up our message today and we're going to put some th things on the screen if you want to be there. and about why Romans 8 28 is the greatest verse in the Bible for Christians but I'm going to tell you a, a brief story and then, and then we'll get out of here on the screen you will see Romans 8 28 broken down in little bitty pieces by words or two or three words and it tells us why this verse is the greatest verse in the Bible for Christians. Because you know, you've you got to break down a verse by word or two words or three words because there's no waste of words in the Bible. Because you thought about all those times that you read the word and in the Bible and you said, ah, it's just an Adam. No, it's not. When you read the word and, it's the greatest addition. It means there's been added, something added. And we know, we know is the greatest certainty. 
that for those who love God, for all of us who love God, we're part of the family of God. The greatest family. All things, the greatest include. Work together, the greatest task. For good, which is the greatest outcome. For those who are called, the greatest surrender. The surrender to Christ and trusting in Him that He will do everything for you according to His purpose. The greatest condition. All things working together for God's good. I had a friend, Gary Stevens. Gary passed away a number of years ago from bone marrow cancer. Gary lived in Pleasant Grove over in East Dallas in not a great part of town. He was a great Christian man. Gary got very sick. He was in Parkland two, three times a week getting blood transfusions. Blood transfusions. And I would call Gary on the phone. And Gary never said, man, Mike. He called me Mike. Party Mike. He said, Mike, he never said I'm sick. I heard. I knew he was. But he was telling me about God. And he would tell me, I went and talked to this lady down the hall about God today. Gary was a great man. I'd go to see him in the park, but I'd go to his room and he wouldn't be there, but he talked loud like me. And you could hear him all over that floor at Parkland Hospital telling people about God. No matter what would happen to him that day, he would say, I, I'm going to go see God. And I can't wait. Gary was... I guess mid fifties at the time, and he would I, you could just hear it blaring all over the hospital. And he meant, and he was truthful in his speaking. Gary got worse, and then he couldn't get out of that bed at Parkland. He didn't have insurance, so he had to go to Parkland. So people that could come to his room would, would come to his room. And he, from his bed, sick as a dog, would tell them about God. And he'd open his Bible and he'd share all his verses, even though most of them he didn't have to open his Bible for, because he already had a memory. Because I'm telling you, you could tell Gary Stevens a phone number one time, and 30 years later, he would remember that phone number. And you could read Scripture to him one time, and if he read it himself, it was committed to memory somehow, I don't know. Gary got really sick and they moved him to Houston, but the great news was they had finally found a suitable bone marrow transplant. Perfect fit. Perfect fit for Gary Stevens. So they moved him to Houston even very, very easy. And they, they had this lady, I think she was in Salt Lake City, Utah. And, and the, the transplant came in and they were going to give him his bone marrow and they gave it to him. Seems like it was on maybe a Wednesday and it went great and Gary, and Gary got his bone marrow transplant. But there was a problem in the hospital that day is they had three or four people that had gone through the same kind of procedure. And after that same kind of procedure, they moved to that perfectly clean room where there's no They had more patience than clean And they, it came down to Gary and another man who was elderly. And they came to Gary and said, you have an option. You know, um, you're first, but this man is older. You know, you can take the clean room or you can let him take the clean room. And you will get you in as soon as he's out. So Gary, being the man he was, said, let that man take that. Gary caught pneumonia that afternoon and died because he gave up that room to somebody else. And I can promise you right now, as much as I can promise you anything here, if it went back and do it again, Gary would have done exactly this. He would have said, give that man my room. Because no matter whether I give him my room or I don't, if I trust in God, God still got a plan. Gary died that afternoon at way too young at that age. But that's an impact on people that we will never forget. Because he was just like I'm speaking to you all the time, man. In there. Energy, I, I, I mean, you can't even believe it all the time. 
He'd call you at 3 in the morning or 8 in the morning or 4 in the afternoon and he was still telling you about the Lord and let's go to church tonight. Matt, my car's not running. My truck's not running. But could you give me a ride to church tonight? Because I can't miss. And he might have been so sick he could barely walk in that church. But he hated to miss the church. I'm going to close this in prayer. Then I'm going to give you one statement. And I ask you, you're, I'm going to ask you to write it down and try to write Join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our Christian brothers and sisters in this sanctuary. I thank you personally, and I believe all the ones here do the same. Thank you for heaven and the Bible and for love and for grace and for peace. I pray for safety and travel as each family here goes home today. I pray for forgiveness of sins, and I thank you for blessing. In Jesus' name, I pray. All right, so I'm going to ask you to write this down and remember this. It's about eight or ten words. It's not when Jesus was nailed to the cross. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, he was thinking about it. And you, because he did it all. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, suffering and you know, Jesus was nailed to the cross. If there's, not, if there's a bigger comfort in this world, I'm not aware of what it is. I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I hope you have a wonderful day. Um, go home and think about some of those things. Maybe it's something that will move you in your life. Thinking about what we just said when Jesus nailed on the cross or some of the other questions I asked. Maybe. Maybe that'll help turn you closer to the Bible and maybe it'll help.